where I have, uh, I'm trying to record it. Yeah. Uh, the, the way I have, I have tried, I have planned to do it is that, you know, instead of me asking you too many questions, uh, I'm just going to pose uh, a little scenario that um, I am actually uh, faced with here in, uh, in India, uh, in Kolkata, and in fact, throughout the world, throughout the country, it's more or less the same situation. So, uh, you know, things that we talk about when we are in, in the USA, in New York, uh, and things that I see here in India, they are so completely different on the surface. Um, and it really uh, blows my mind because here, people simply do not have any idea what is going on uh, across the planet. Uh, there is practically no media discussion on you know, the ongoing war or you know, climate change, the looming disaster uh, in terms of the environmental crisis and things like that. Here, uh, the people up there they simply do not care about anything. They are doing fine. And the people at the bottom of the economic strata, they're so busy making ends meet that they simply do not understand, you know, about the uh, seriousness of the crisis. And people in the middle, the middle class, they're like, with some exceptions, they are vastly brainwashed by the media and the people in power. And either they're completely detached from reality or politics, they've become too apolitical, or some of them who understand the gravity of the situation, they believe that there is no way they can change things. And it is like, it has always been like this and it is always going to be like that. So given that scenario, how do you actually reach out and make connections with people, especially the younger generation and impress on them about the seriousness of the you know, geopolitical scenario, the environmental crisis, the war and violence and, and looming fascism and things like that. I simply do not know. So I just you know, leave it up to you uh, to tell us what is going on and give us some advice as to what we can do. Nobody can give you any advice. This is the problem that exists everywhere. So I can tell you my own experiences. Uh, take, say, the Vietnam War, the worst at, at crime since the Second World War. Uh, I've been working hard on it for over 60 years now. Still, nobody in the United States knows anything about it. So for example, there was a, a study taken at one of the elite universities, uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. That's the elite university of the Massachusetts system highly educated society, liberal state, elite students. Uh, they asked a series of questions. One of them was to estimate the number of Vietnamese casualties. The mean estimate was 100,000. That's about 5% of the US government figure, probably two to 3% of the actual figure. It's as if in Germany today, you ask people how many people were killed at the Holocaust, and they said uh, 200,000. Well, we think there's a certain problem in Germany if they said, if that happened. This is the United States. We see it all the time. I don't know if you caught this a couple of days ago, but uh, George W. Bush, second Bush, was on television and he was give, reading a speech about the uh, one, one topic that we're allowed to talk about, Ukraine. And he said, 
uh, it was a criminal invasion by a Nazi-like aggressor of Iraq. And he said, oh, sorry, Ukraine. Everybody laughed. Funny. I happened to be on Iraqi television the next day. They weren't laughing. They didn't think it was funny. But that's the United States, highly educated society. I don't think you can find one statement by anyone anywhere near the mainstream establishment, the political class, uh, academics, anywhere. One statement saying that the invasion of Iraq was a war crime. Actually, I did a simple study about this, just to look into it. Uh, I did a, one of the things that if everyone is supposed to say now, everyone, any self-respecting person, is the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. You can't talk about the invasion. You have to talk about the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Well, I did a small experiment, which you can do yourself. I Googled the phrase, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, uh, two and a half million hits in half a second. Then I Googled the phrase, unprovoked invasion of Iraq, nothing, couple of cases by opponents of the war, that's all, or marginal left groups. I doubt if there's one sentence by anyone who can be in the mainstream whoever said unprovoked invasion of Iraq. Well, that's dramatic enough as it is, even more so when you look at the facts. The Iraq invasion was totally unprovoked, not a hint of provocation. The Ukraine invasion was definitely provoked by longstanding US efforts to integrate Ukraine into the NATO military command and explicit statements saying that we're not going to pay any attention to Russian security concerns. So the facts are exactly the opposite. Doesn't matter. This is a totalitarian culture. You cannot break from the party line. Cannot. Anyone who tries, it's crushed. England is the same. So for example, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who was of course smashed by the whole mainstream establishment because he tried to create a popular labor party that would answer to the needs of working people and the poor. He was destroyed with vicious attacks, uh, claims of anti-Semitism, all sorts of things. Well, a couple of, about a couple of weeks ago, he made a statement. He said, uh, we should try to find a negotiated settlement to the Ukraine conflict so that this, these horrors of this criminal war don't go on. And he said, after Ukraine is uh, settled one way or another, we should rethink the question of uh, the status of NATO. Do we really need NATO in its present form? For that, he was virtually thrown out of the Labour Party, okay? Are we back? Yes, we are. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Well, sorry. that's the situation here. So if you're asking for advice, you're turning to the wrong place. There is no advice except to keep working, keep trying. Case of Indochina, 60 years. I'll keep going as long as I can. How do you how do you make a connection with the people who are actually suffering? You know, I think about the uh, famous quote of uh, Aldous Huxley that that people are living in a prison with an invisible wall, and they think they are happy and they are they are free, uh, where they are actually in reality. Uh, in a prison and, and uh, never to be able to escape from it. 
you know, and that, that this is really the, the ultimate totalitarianism that we are faced with and nobody really understands the gravity of it. Well, take India. I don't have to tell you, you know much better than I do, but uh, temperatures in India, some parts of India and Pakistan are coming close to 50 degrees Celsius. It's unlivable. Uh, the, you know, actually, if it gets, I live in Arizona, if the temperature gets into the 40s, which it does, we can survive. I have a solar panels, a, a advanced air conditioner. Uh, we can come inside. Also, it's dry. It's not like India. So it's dry heat, so you can survive it. India, you can't. India, South Asia altogether is going to become unlivable. Unlivable, maybe in a generation. It's not far off. Well, this is right in front of people's eyes. Meanwhile, India and Pakistan are pouring money into advanced weapons so they can slaughter each other. That's why both countries are collapsing into a disaster. Actually, the best description of this that I saw was in an article by Arundhati Roy a couple of years ago. It was kind of semi-fictional. She described how on the uh, mountains way up 12,000 feet high, where the Indian and Pakistani soldiers are fighting on the line of control. She described eloquently how as the glaciers are receding, you can see the remnants of the fighting, uh, the helmets, the, you know, the rifles, things, the, the remains of the skeletons of the soldiers as the glaciers are receding a uh, sign that both India and Pakistan are finished. They're going to disappear uh, into blazing heat that nobody will survive. Well, that's the human species. Uh, we have, humans have, human technological intelligence has advanced very rapidly to the point where we have designed means to destroy ourselves. Human moral capacity lags very far behind. And unless that gap is filled, we're finished. Not in the distant future. How uh, you have you have gone through so many movements uh, and, and you've seen you know the, the Second World War and you've seen the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And you've seen the civil rights struggle and the immigrant rights struggle, and, and you know you have gone through like a huge part of American history, and and you have always given us, you know, uh, 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 in spite of all the odds, you have really given us a sense of hope and optimism, you know, throughout your life, uh, and and now at this point, at, at this crossroads, uh, what do you really see? Uh, you know, like uh, 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 going to happen in the in the coming uh, a decade or, or a couple of decades in terms of the existence of human civilization and and people's intelligence and their desire to uh, form uh, some type of a society where people really care for each other and they have a desire to move forward instead of falling backward and become victims of racism and, and hatred. And, and violence and things like that. You know, answers, there are well worked out feasible answers to every serious problem we face. There are people dedicated to working on them, very dedicated, uh, mostly young people. So, the great demonstrations, protests, civil disobedience in England, the United States, now including senior scientists who you know, chain themselves to 
building and trying to get attention. These are people working on it hard. Will they succeed? It's up to us. We can do what we can. And there is progress. Sometimes it's, it's real, but almost laughable. Uh, if you take a look at the New York Times today, there's a very important lead story. It's about crimes in 1825. They're finally a major story rehearsing the way Haiti has been destroyed for 200 years because Haiti dared to become the first free country of free men in the Western Hemisphere. That's a crime for which Haiti has been punished for 200 years. And it's a good story. It goes through the record, the French record, which is despicable, uh, vicious, Nazi-like, and re remains today. They don't even know it in France. They don't even talk about it. Hideous. And then it does, to its credit, say a few things, nowhere near enough about the hideous U.S. rule. A uh, few things about it, but some at least. Okay, so here's a story that's 200 years old, which we're finally reaching a level of civilization where some of us can discuss. Well, that's progress. Uh, and there's more progress. Uh, the, in many respects, you mentioned civil rights, women's rights, uh, uh, other things. There's been considerable progress in the last uh, uh, 50 years. There's now efforts to uh, roll it back, to go back to the days of Jim Crow, to stop teaching American history. When the Republicans take office again, as they presumably will, uh, they will probably continue to pass federal laws banning the teaching of American history in schools. They don't say that, but that's what it amounts to. It means you cannot teach anything that would be divisive or that would make students, meaning white students, feel uncomfortable. Those are the laws. It's a way of saying you can teach the history of slavery the history of Jim Crow. You can't teach the core of American history in our totalitarian culture. Well, that's the backlash coming from the Republican Party. Uh, but there are people fighting, and that's the struggle. Same in India. Everybody has given up. There are people working hard at JNU, other places, to try to combat the uh, Modi effort to destroy Indian democracy and to create a racist Hindu uh, ethnocracy. There are struggles. It's not over. Uh, there are struggles about Kashmir, where horrible crimes are taking place constantly. Not enough. The West refuses to get involved because it doesn't care. Uh, the United States is happy to uh, have a racist India as an ally. It's part of the reactionary international that the U.S. wants to run. Uh, we're seeing it right at this moment, right now, in Hungary. Uh, Hungary is the a racist state. What's called, but it calls itself an illiberal democracy destroying democratic practices, destroying the free press, free universities, seriously racist. Uh, right now in Hungary, there's a meeting going on of the most reactionary elements in Europe, the neo-fascist elements, which exist all over Europe. They're meeting in Hungary along with the core of the Republican Party, which is the main guest there, okay? That's a reactionary international taking shape. Modi's India is a natural member. Uh, the dictatorships of the Persian Gulf are 
members uh, run by Washington. Well, that's part of the way the world order is developing, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can struggle against it. I mean, um, old enough to remember the 1930s. It looked as if the world was sinking into total fascism. Uh, Europe did descend to fascism. The United States was different. There was a revived labor movement. It had been crushed in the 1920s, revived. There were lively political, left political organizations, uh, militant labor actions, sympathetic administration. U.S. led the way to social democracy. Well, can happen again. Yeah, you've mentioned about uh, Haiti and how um, they destroyed the and looted uh, the the wealth uh, of that um, island nation. And you know, like a very similar thing happened here in India and particularly in in Bengal. And they basically crushed. First, they crushed the revolutionary anti-British struggle, and then they partitioned Bengal, uh, which was like completely disastrous. Uh, for the people of Bengal and the Radcliffe line uh, of partition was so arbitrary that even today you can see, you know, along the, the borders of Bengal, you know, the part of a house is in Bangladesh and another part of the same house is in India. So that is how arbitrary it was. And, and by the time they did it, they have already looted the huge wealth and you know transformed one of the most prosperous places on earth into one of the poorest uh, places uh, before they left. Uh, so that is the history and the and the party BJP and and its mentor RSS, uh, where Modi and all these people belong. They not only did not take part in the independence struggle and the revolutionary movement of any kind. They were a thousand miles away from it. There's many of them actually, you know, like collaborated with the British government and worked as their spies. And then eventually after the partition and independence, you know, their, their members killed Mahatma Gandhi. And they are now in India's seat of power. You know, how much more ironic uh, political turn of events you can see anywhere in the world. But there is a very conscious effort by the people in power to make people forget about the history and they're, they're changing history and changing textbooks all the time, which is like really one of the biggest threats. Here too, there's progress like this. If you can see it, uh, a book which is finally exposing the hideous record of British imperialism. 250 years late, but it's happening. There are others like uh, Catherine uh, Elkin just published a long detailed study of the hideous atrocities of the British Empire. And it's finally beginning to penetrate in England where there's been total celebration of the marvels of the empire for centuries. Now they're finally beginning. A book like this does get it reviewed, and it's making a few people think we're not so wonderful. We committed hideous atrocities. Uh, India in the 17th century had about 25% of world GDP. It was the most advanced country in the world. After the British got through with it, it's 3% of GDP devastated country. Well, like Haiti, all of this is beginning barely to seep into Western consciousness. France is so backward that they can't even look at their crimes they committed in Haiti and Algeria, barely look at them. But there are elements even in France which are catching up. Okay, those are, that's progress. Horribly slow, but it's something and it's changing consciousness. We can accelerate it, make it move faster. Uh, that's the hope. Uh, if you want a prediction, 
doesn't look very auspicious, but there are opportunities and we have to grasp them. That's about all we can say. There's no advice. We know exactly how to do it. Uh, education, organization, activism is very slow, it's hard, but it's the only way to go ahead. And we have opportunities. Uh, we do not live, we live in totalitarian cultures, but not in totalitarian states. So I can say what I'm saying, and there aren't going to be stormtroopers coming in to send me to a concentration camp. Well, that's a good thing. Many places, they don't have that uh, advantage. We have it. We can use it. Same is true in India. Plenty of repression, horrible repression. But there still is a, a range of opportunities and freedom. Yes, I, I have always um, seen you uh, as, as my intellectual mentor, and I have always uh, followed uh, your talks uh, and your writings, and I've been in constant touch with you since my days at Columbia uh, School of Journalism. And now, uh, uh, you know, after my first meeting with you uh, at Columbia, uh, some 22 years have passed, and I still uh, see Noam Chomsky as, as my friend and as my mentor, and as particularly as someone who actually uh, keeps my hopes alive that something good can actually happen even out of this uh, miserable state of affairs. But I, I need a final word uh, from you without wasting too much of your time. How do you actually uh, envision, uh, uh, you know, that the younger generation, they're so, uh, you know, like uh, uh, they're, they're, they're becoming quick victims of uh, individualistic pursuit of happiness and, you know, their social media uh, fun and, and memes and, and things like that. Uh, how do you actually envision that uh, there could be a way to make a connection with the younger generation so that they come forward and, and take matters in their own hands? and transform the world uh, to be a, a better place to live. I think they're actually taking the lead. It's the younger generation that's taking the lead on the most crucial issues we face, like destruction of the environment. So what we can do is support them in their efforts. If uh, Extinction Rebellion is having demonstrations and actions, we can join and support them, try to give positive, they're gonna be bitterly denounced, of course. We can make, take the opposite position, say they should be supported. If we had time, I could find a t-shirt over there which has just stop oil on it, we can, I, which I wear sometimes when I'm giving talks, okay? Those are the things we can do. It's not huge, but whatever we can do within our capacity to support young people who are trying to create a better world. And there are plenty of them. Uh, they're denounced, they're condemned. If there are people, older people like Jeremy Corbyn, who's bitterly condemned, vilified, demonized, because he tries to take a decent stand that's England, uh, same elsewhere. So you just continue. I, uh, final uh, final uh, word from Noam Chomsky to the uh, younger generation, India and Bengal. Final word is you have a, you have a choice. You're living at a, a unique moment in history. Human beings have been around for a couple hundred thousand years. It's not very long. Uh, we now are facing a question which has never arisen in human history. Will the human experiment continue or will it end ingloriously? Ingloriously. 
with what's called the sixth extinction. We destroy most living things and ourselves as well. And the younger generation had the challenge, unprecedented challenge of having the need to answer this question. They cannot evade it. Evade it says we're doomed along with everything else we destroy can have a positive answer. It's a tremendous responsibility. It's an exciting challenge. You, the younger generation, can save the human species from its criminality and stupidity. You can overcome this huge gap between technological progress and moral progress, enormous gap. It's up to you to show that that gap can be filled. That's a challenge, cannot be avoided. There's no way to refuse to give an answer. If you refuse, you're saying, let's kill ourselves and everyone else. That's the answer. So you have to make a choice. Thank you very much, Noam, uh, for your time. And I'm sorry about this uh, uh, internet connection problem, uh, but uh, I really thank you for your patience. And I hope that uh, we can I have the privilege to have uh, a, a few more conversations with you in the coming days, and I will definitely be in touch with you when I come back to New York in July. And uh, I, I will, if I have any questions, then as always, I'll, I'll send you an email. Uh, and I would always, always appreciate your thoughts and your mentoring and your, your words of wisdom that always uh, keep me going and uh, help me to look forward uh, to a better future. So thank you very, very much. Very good to talk to you. Let's keep in touch. Thank you so much. Bye.